Hi, hello everybody. My name is Alex Forstadt. I work with the ERC4337 team on account abstraction. And uh, today I will talk to you about the new uh, project, uh, project that we are working on that's called native account abstraction. So when you talk about native account abstraction, there are three uh, main questions that we want to ask ourselves. One is what are we abstracting? The second one is what do we enshrine and make native? And the third one is like, why are we doing it? Uh, so let's dive into it. Uh, first question is what even is an account for us when we're talking about it? So uh, account for us is an entity that represents a user on blockchain. We are talking specifically about currently externally owned accounts. So it represents a user with an address. The address has uh, like it's a 20 byte uh, string. Uh, it is known, it, the address that holds Vale is Ether and tokens. And this address is controlled directly by uh, the private key, of, by ECDSA private key. Uh, this is the address that will be executing the transactions, which means uh, calling the target contract with call data that is provided by the user. And this is also the address that will be charged for gas uh, during the transaction. The transaction is paid by this account. And this is currently all part of the Ethereum protocol. It is encoded and enshrined as a protocol, this kind of accounts. Uh, so the next question is, what do we abstract away? So basically, we abstract all of these things away. And when we say abstract, we mean that we allow contracts to change how these things are done. So you still have an address. Uh, this address is controlled by a smart contract. There is a contract deployed to this address. And now this is a contract that holds tokens and uh, value and uh, does that. So this is not different from a multi-sig like Gnosis or Argent. Uh, however, we abstract away authentication entirely, which means the transaction will be valid if the function that we defined in this contract called validate transaction returns a correct value and not by a given verifying the given private key, a signature. Uh, we also abstract the execution. Instead of like just pro user providing a target and the call data to invoke it, we give the, the data to the smart contract to decide what to do with it. And we also abstract the gas payment, meaning that uh, it doesn't have to be the contract that is the, an account who pays for gas. We allow other contracts to pay for this gas, other entities to pay for the gas of this transaction. Uh, there are limitless, endless uh, possibilities with a client abstraction, but I would like to give some examples that are not really possible with uh, uh, externally owned accounts as they are. Like one, uh, authentication. We have one way to authenticate a transaction. And for some users, this may, the one we have, the, so signing a transaction every time can be way too complex. Let's say there is a game that wants to introduce a gaming session. If uh, every action in this game is a transaction, you will be constantly clicking your MetaMask confirm, confirm, confirm. With, uh, smart, uh, with account abstraction, you can generate a target specific uh, like session key that enables the site to do what it wants with the targets uh, that uh, you approved. And for other use cases, uh, this authentication with the single private key cannot be strict enough. Like a corporation, we want all accounted controls to have a multi-sig with a threshold. Uh, and uh, we also enable that natively. Currently, they would have to still own an operator private key that controls their multi-sigs, so it creates also a lot of friction. Uh, we natively enable ways to recover these accounts. Uh, we can finally have a native UI for social recovery. And, and another like major feature that is missing for externally owned accounts is replace, le replacing your key. So let's say you had your 12 words written on a piece of paper and you kept it in a book and uh, now you are not sure if anybody saw them. So you want to m change your key, but you also have like positions on exchanges and you don't want to migrate all the assets to a new address but you want a different secret to control your account, we will enable that with account abstraction. But with the UA, it is not possible. 
uh, the great opportunity for, to pay for gas for uh, dApps that want to onboard new users who may not have a correct asset or any assets on a given chain. Uh, previously, in most cases, there was still a process of you need to get this, I don't know, girly optimism tokens to make a transaction on this chain. If you get an airdrop of our tokens uh, with a gas abstraction, you can pay in other tokens, or a DAP can outright sponsor specific actions of an account. And with extracted execution, we can have use cases that were uh, previously basically impossible, like a an account can make a batch of transactions and it can use the results of one transaction as an input to another, it can read on-chain state during a transaction execution, which is almost impossible to achieve with externally owned accounts. Uh, so we all have that. What does it mean to make it natively? What does it mean for us to enshrine it? When we say that we make an account abstraction native, what we mean is that uh, a, a transaction is fully initiated by a smart contract with a smart contract account. It, it does not rely on any externally owned account. So once a user creates a transaction, it's broadcast to a mempool, it's picked up by a block builder, and the Ethereum virtual machine itself performs all the actions. So we have ERC4337, and it already does account abstraction for us. However, in red, you see that uh, the bundler servers that are uh, ERC4337 like workhorses, they own and operate an externally owned account. When they make a call to the entry point contract, this is a legacy transaction. This is type two transaction that they sign and the bundler server pays gas for this transaction and an entry point contract compensates this externally owned account with a value on chain. However, this still enshrines and establishes an externally owned account and its private key as part of our account abstraction solution. So there are some issues with it. So what are the main issues? Like the first, and like it's a big one for us, is gas efficiency. Because there are uh, wrappers and wrappers and uh, layers of abstraction here, uh, the uh, user operations of ERC-467, they are not very gas efficient. There is an overhead of around 20,000 gas uh, for user operation. Uh, and it, it often gets uh, bigger than that. And the best way to remove this inefficiency is to actually put all this uh, protocol into the consensus layer of Ethereum. Uh, another issue is what we say code bug risk. So entry point contract in ERC-4337 is still a smart contract. It has been audited and formally verified, but still there is a risk of a bug. And normally when there is a bug in a smart contract, just all uh, of the smart accounts that would rely on this entry point, uh, they would need to migrate. There can be a catastrophic event or less catastrophic, but that would be a lot of overhead for them to change the implementation of uh, ERC-4337 that they are using. However, if it's a part of a protocol, it's implied and it's explicit that uh, it works and the core developers of Ethereum or other like rollups will be responsible to making sure that this is safe and it stays safe uh, uh, going forward. Uh, another thing is uh, some EVM opcodes don't work well in the context of ERC-4337. For example, TX origin returns the account that made the transaction in the first place. However, with ERC-4337, it would return an address of a bundler, an EOA that is not relevant to a transaction in any case. It just happens to be a server that created this abstracted uh, uh, transaction. Uh, another one, this is a growing concern, is the censorship resistance. Like as Ethereum is going towards a proposer builder separation, uh, it becomes easier to censor transactions. And there are ways to uh, mediate it with uh, inclusion lists. Uh, however, they all target uh, transactions. And uh, what uh, user operations do, they are bundled together in a single large blob transaction, uh, which is 
not transparent for the inclusion list. So bundlers can censor individuals in user operations and uh, we will not be able to provide the censorship resistance we want with the non-native account abstraction solution. And then the last one, but not least, some networks that are starting right now, they may decide to go without EOAs. Uh, there are, I think, already some networks that do that. So if you, want, if you can start now and not have this reliance on a specific signature scheme and just an allow arbitrary validation of transactions, some may want to do that, and it would not be possible if we would still require a server to sign transactions uh, that bundle your operations together. You can read uh, on this link an article from Vitalik uh, on this topic. Uh, I'll move on and I'll have it later. So what does uh, validation of a transaction look like today? So this is a hypothetical code from the previous presentation also of what are the steps uh, that the transaction does when it's being validated. If, if it was written in Solidity, it's not. But if it was written in Solidity, this is more or less what it would uh, have looked like. Uh, it would uh, verify the transaction signature. It would uh, verify the account nonce. It would uh, verify that account has enough balance to pay for uh, the transaction that is happening. It would uh, verify that uh, the transaction has a sufficient base fee. And then it would increment the nonce. And only after that, the transaction proceeds. This is what current transactions, externally owned account transactions do uh, in Ethereum. Uh, so uh, can, can we do more? So in order to achieve account abstraction natively, the first thing that we do is we separate the code that is running inside the transaction into multiple uh, smaller frames. So the concept, the frame is, uh, you can think of it as, as a sub-transaction, a small transaction that is part of a bigger one, or a, a separate call to a function that is top level, like you have multiple main uh, functions, main entry points to your transaction. So on the top is how transactions work today. There is a validation that is happening in the protocol, and on the right you have a single top level execution frame of a, uh, of a transaction. So you have a target contract and you call it with a value, with some call data, and you provide a gas price and gas limit to this call. And this is the top frame and all other executions happen from there. For, for, for example, if you call transfer in the ERC20 token, so the call data would be a function of like transfer in this token. Uh, and as I said, Validation includes uh, signature, nonce, balance, gas limits, and gas fee payments. So when we go to abstracted transaction, uh, we divide uh, it into two big groups of frames. The first group is validation frames. Uh, in validation frames, uh, what we do is uh, we validate and increment nonce separately on chain and a smart account. If need to be, uh, we deploy an account so if this is the first transaction the user is doing, we deploy code at an address that he said he wants a code in. Uh, then we provide the details of this transaction to the account. Uh, and the account has run some EVM, Solidity code, to decide if transaction is valid. And then if, if the contract is provided, the contract that pays for gas is provided, and we call it a paymaster contract. We provide these trans uh, transaction details also to this contract, basically to ask him like, this is a transaction that is happening, are you willing to pay for it? So only if all four of these uh, calls uh, succeed, we proceed to include this transaction in the block. The transaction cannot be included in a block in any, if any of these steps fail. And uh, once they are complete and the transaction is inside the block, we actually perform the inner call that is the execution frame. And also it's a detail. We also allow the paymaster to do some operations after the uh, execution. So it is also considered to be an execution frame. But the main thing here is the uh, call, uh, actual account execution function that is being called. Uh, Okay, so this is a hypothetical uh, code and hypothetical uh, CLI, where if you were sending a legacy transaction type to this contract, to the execute function, only 
the execute function is actually run. But uh, this is, shows an idea that if you send a account abstracted transaction to this contract, it will actually run the validate transaction function, and only then it would run, run the execute function. So it's a single transaction that calls two functions as a top frame. Right. Uh, so the four uh, validation frames that we have in uh, the current state of native account abstraction proposal are nonce validation. So there is a smart contract that manages nonces of every smart account. Uh, and this is the contract who is responsible for verifying and incrementing the nonce of a transaction. I said about account deployment, account validation, we define a function signature. This is validate transaction, and we pass in the transaction hash and an encoded transaction, and it must return a special value to indicate that it accepts a transaction. And the same thing happens for a paymaster. The function name is different, but it accepts the same parameters, and it returns the same. It, it can also return context for later. We will get to that uh, after. Uh, so next, uh, abstracting the execution frame, I talked about it briefly. Uh, instead of invoking the target contract directly, account provide, uh, abstracted transactions provide this call data to the smart account. And this allows smart account to interpret the input and perform actions that it decides. Um, I don't want to say the word intense, but it can be something in that case that you tell your account like what you want to do, and the account can interpret it arbitrarily. Uh, next. So one issue that we have doing it is we need to allow block builders to construct uh, good blocks. And we need to do it uh, fast, secure, and efficient. Uh, so the validation function of externally owned account, which checks a signature and a nonce and all, they are all obviously isolated. Look at, you can look at them separately on different states and they cannot intervene with each other. Like this is just one account, it has its own nonce, and another one that has its own nonce and a signature. This is not necessarily the case with uh, account abstraction. Because the validation happens on chain and it has access to blockchain state, transaction can uh, change each other's uh, validity. Uh, so, and block builders don't have a lot of time to prepare a block. They cannot spend hours and hours iterating over combinations of transactions that work. Uh, so in order to allow them to find blocks, uh, we do a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is we uh, try to sandbox each validation function in a way that uh, the block builder can parallelize a validation. So it can run uh, different transactions on the same state across different CPU clusters, so without having to talk to each other. And we see the individual validation of a function, if the, function, if the transaction is valid or not. So in this example, uh, all transactions have passed a validation function successfully, except for transaction C. So then, when the block builder builds a block, it just does not include the transaction C in a block. But now, uh, what block builder needs to do, it needs to validate the entire block. It needs to make sure that uh, transactions did not interfere with each other because they were validated separately. And if the sandboxing works and we manage to isolate transactions, this is the picture we would get. If the transaction passed a validation individually, it passes validation inside the block with, mixed with other transactions. However, if the uh, sandboxing fails, this is an example, a transaction A sets the value of some variable to one, and all the other uh, transactions in their validation functions revert if X is set to one, then these transactions were all valid individually, but as a block together, only one of them can go through, and the others will uh, not work. And this also presents a denial of service attack vector, because it's, it can be very cheap for an attacker to fill the mempool with transactions that are mutually exclusive and see bundlers spend CPU cycles validating transactions that are valid individually but are not valid in the block, so they need to find a different block uh, indefinitely. So we worked hard to uh, write these uh, validation rules 
as we call them. So this is a separate ERC, ERC7562, that define uh, rules uh, for the code that can be executed in the validation functions. So there are limitations that are applied to these functions. Uh, however, these are ERC, meaning that it is not part of the consensus layer change. Like if the bundler, a block builder, wants to include a transaction that doesn't satisfy these rules, it's allowed to do so. However, if you populate mempool with transactions that validate this rule, violate these rules, uh, you will not have a function in mempool because uh, like you, you would not know if you can include this transaction in the block. Uh, so uh, the, the rules are basically, they make sense, but they become more and more uh, complex as you go in. So for example, we don't uh, want to allow uh, transactions during their validation to observe the environment. We don't want them to observe a timestamp or block hash or a balance of other contract because this is an easy way to like randomly invalidate your transaction when it's included in a block. We restrict uh, access from one contract uh, storage to another and uh, in many ways, uh, the, we isolate the storage that is available to a validation function. And there are also like things like limiting the number of transactions that uh, from the same entities that can be included in the same block so that there is no risk of, uh, for example, a privileged contract like a paymaster invalidating many transactions in your block. Uh, it's still a pull request. You uh, see the rules at the link here, but they are not very different from what we have. They actually will be the same as the rules applied in ERC-4337 account abstraction. Um, now, uh, there is a thing that the rules, the validation rules, are applied to the validation function. However, there is still the body of a transaction, the actual execution that can do what user said it to do. Like it can do arbitrary action. It is not feasible for us to limit the execution of a transaction. We cannot say that your transaction is only allowed to change your own storage and not allowed to change the storage of some other contract. So what can happen is that uh, while the validation function uh, did not violate its uh, constraints and its sandbox, the execution actually can do whatever it wants. Uh, so here we come to the third realization of what we need to do for account abstraction. We split the transaction into two parts and the validation frames are not run together with execution. We put them in a separate place in the block and the executions run uh, separately. So all the validations are executed first and only then we start applying the execution functions. Uh, so, if you are developing a smart contract, you need to be a uh, wallet. You need to be aware that uh, between the validation of your function and the execution, then there can be a different code running. It's not necessary. Uh, the transaction is not atomic per se. There is an atomic validation part and an atomic execution part. So here is the example. Uh, let's say we have three transactions: a green, a blue, and a yellow one. And uh, we want to isolate uh, access to the same state by validation frames. So what we do is we apply them in this order. We apply the green transaction validation part, then the blue transaction validation part, then the yellow one, and then we start applying the changes that happen in the execution of a given transaction. Uh, right. So this is how it would look like in this hypothetical uh, CLI. If you were to call three transactions, uh, like three different wallets execute function, what you would see output is that you are inside the validation frame three times in a row, and then you are inside an execution frame three times in a row. They are not linearly applied. Um, right. So if that is clear, there are a few things that are not uh, per se a part of account abstraction, but they are extras that we added to this uh, uh, pro uh, improvement proposal based on the feedback we received from the community. One part of feedback uh, that we received is that uh, 64 bytes nonce are not enough for many applications, especially when we are talking about smart contract accounts 
that can be uh, used by groups of people. And if they are only using a sequential incremental integer nonce, uh, they can like step on each other's toes and like invalidate each other's transactions while they are being prepared and signed. So uh, smart contract account developers wanted to enable unique transaction nonces that are not sequential. So we decided to increase the nonce uh, parameter size to 256 bits. And we dedicate 192 bits to the key part, which can be arbitrary value. And the 64-bit uh, value part, that is actually a monotonically increasing integer uh, nonce. Uh, so if transaction wants to use unique nonce every time, it just leaves the value part empty and creates a unique 192-byte key for every transaction that is being signed. Or if you want to use a just sequential nonce, you can use a key field empty and just increment the value part of a transaction. You can have like <coughs> lanes, like lane one, lane two, lane three. Uh, right. Another part that we added to our account abstraction proposal is uh, gas abstraction. So uh, the thing is here, like we want to allow uh, also externally owned accounts that exist today to benefit from a gas abstraction and uh, smart contract accounts. So uh, we allow uh, externally owned accounts to sign uh, account abstracted transactions, which would mean that uh, the gas for the transaction is charged uh, from the paymaster contract and not from the sender, regardless if it's a smart contract wallet or a regular uh, externally owned account. Uh, right. And another thing that uh, we introduced is uh, transaction validity time ranges. So in a regular Ethereum transaction, once you sign it, it's probably valid. And until it is mined, or an other transaction with the same nonce is mined, it will remain a valid transaction indefinitely. So if you sign a transaction, broadcasted it, and it wasn't included in a block, it can be included in a block anytime in the future, in a year, in 10 years, tomorrow, uh, regardless if you still have the same intent to do it, you don't remember you signed it. Uh, and you cannot delay the execution. You cannot say that you sign a transaction that will be valid like starting next week. Uh, what account abstraction adds to the core protocol is that a transaction has a valid from and valid until uh, parameters. So you can uh, sign a transaction at any time you want in any way you want uh, as a smart contract account. Uh, and this defines the validity of the transaction uh, explicitly and very specifically. And this is also applied to externally owned accounts, they are allowed to sign such transactions. So in order to achieve that, we introduce a new transaction type. Uh, this uh, is like following the transaction type uh, one that added access list, transaction type two added uh, fees, base fee per gas, priority fee per gas, uh, transaction type three will add uh, blob tr uh, uh, transactions, and uh, hopefully transaction four will add uh, account abstracted transactions. So the fields that are new to this transaction type are actually the sender, uh, which means that in a normal transaction, you de derive the address of a sender from the signature by doing the EC recover. This is not possible with an arbitrary signature format. So we tell explicitly which address is the sender. Uh, we allow a builder fee, uh, which is a little bit technical, but we allow to pay an explicit fee to the builder that is not tied to gas. This is this may be relevant to layer two uh, rollups where gas is so cheap that it may not compensate some computation. Uh, we still provide the call data, but in addition, we have what we call paymaster data and deployer data. This is a, These are optional fields that are used if you include a paymaster, a contract who pays for gas, or a deployer which means you don't have code in your uh, sender account and you want to inject it. And also these uh, separate frames, they have their own uh, validation gas limit and paymaster gas limit. So they have their own gas limits. And that's uh, basically it. Other fields are remain same from uh, other transaction types. Uh, so account abstraction on Ethereum is not new. Like it was the, one of the first, like the first account abstraction mentioned in the EAP repo is EAP 86 
by Vitalik Buterin. Uh, so we talked about abstracting transaction origin signature. Like that was not a mature state for account abstraction. Uh, EAP 1014, the one that added uh, create to uh, opcode, was actually uh, aimed at uh, enshrining account abstraction in the future. And the first uh, actual account abstraction EAP was EAP 2938. It is very advanced in AP, and a lot of our uh, decisions are based on it. However, uh, in uh, my view, uh, it relies on a Pegas opcode to transition a single transaction from a validation phase to an execution phase, uh, which does not explain how a block builders would produce the blocks that uh, include such transactions. How would they prevent execution and validation from like interrupting with each other? Another one that is in uh, account abstraction realm is EAP 3074. This one uh, uh, suggests uh, to add to opcodes, auth and auth call. Uh, what they do in two words is it allows a, an externally owned account to make a delegate call to another account. So instead of just calling another account, you allow a smart contract to uh, take over the context and be the message sender of your transactions. Uh, this has two issues in my opinion. One is it enshrines the ECDSA signature, like this is an EOA that's controlled by ECDSA signature. And now it can sign an approval for another contract with this private key, but it still uh, has a not a regular account. And so we don't see it as an alternative to ERC4337 or a native account abstraction. And we see it as solving another like additional problem to uh, what we are trying to solve, which is mostly a validity of a transaction. All right. So this is a very huge change, and it's a breaking everything change. Uh, so it's very complex, and it makes sense for us uh, to first aim it to uh, layer twos and rollups. So we will be introducing a rollup improvement proposal process. So instead of doing an Ethereum improvement proposal, uh, we are publishing this as a, an RIP, rollup improvement proposal. So we want to do that because uh, side chains, in our opinion, and layer twos, they will all benefit from following the single uh, standard for native account abstraction instead of everyone trying to reinvent their own. And uh, there are already some uh, layer twos that added account abstraction based on ERC4337 natively to their protocols, but there are uh, differences and in incompatibilities and we want to work with all uh, layer twos uh, to implement the same standard. Uh, so this is, the repo already exists. You can go there. We are the first rollup improvement proposal, uh, and it will be properly announced uh, later. Uh, so there is a question, obvious question, like what does this uh, RIP, what does this proposal mean for the broader like ERC four three six seven ecosystem? So the first thing uh, that we must say is that uh, our aim is uh, to have a cross compatibility between ERC4337 and uh, native account abstraction. So uh, it will go both ways. So we will make sure that uh, if it works for one, it works for another in terms of uh, contracts, paymasters, uh, deployers, and any component. Uh, the, uh, we expect that some networks will be quick to adopt native account abstraction. And we expect that others, especially Ethereum mainnet, will take more and more time to adopt this uh, breaking change. So there will be a lot, a lot of interoperability and uh, times when uh, uh, it's support, what, like one solution works for one chain and another is using, used for other chains. Uh, once the chain approves uh, and adopts native account abstraction, we want to make sure that there is a clear and straightforward migration uh, path for contracts and other players in the ecosystem to move to native account abstraction. And there is a question of a role of a bundler. So right now with uh, ERC account abstraction, uh, bundlers need to maintain a special relationship with the block builder. Uh, they cannot broadcast their bundles to the mempool because they will be griefed. Uh, so e this similar dynamics stays in action for native account abstraction. So we expect that there will be bundlers 
who will uh, act uh, as a kind of MAV searchers, who will provide block builders with uh, valid batches of uh, type 4 transactions going forward. And this is how they will interact uh, with builders. This is why uh, the progress that's been, been made by bundlers is still very relevant uh, for the native account abstraction. Okay, so join us for uh, all the discussions, provide feedback, uh, track our development in our Discord. And these are the links. The uh, RIP itself is RIP 7560, uh, available at this link, and the new RIP repo, not e EAP repo. And please join our Discord to provide feedback and hear back from us. Any questions? Uh. Um, given the restrictions on access to the environment, like time in the validation in the validation phase to prevent um, some of the the griefing issues, how did how did you do the uh, valid before, valid from and until? Right, so your uh, Solidity code is not allowed to access time, but the, the EVM is allowed to access time. So instead of checking time yourself, you provide the time range to, to the machine. Like this is a return value of your validation function. It says that this transaction is valid and when it is valid. And, uh, and the EVM checks it. So you cannot do weird things like be valid on an even second, but you can be valid in a in a time range. Yeah. How do you how do you prevent um, bots from calling the paymaster and just draining the paymaster? Yes. So the paymaster uh, is a smart contract, so it must maintain an on-chain logic to define if it wants to pay for a transaction or not. So it can maintain like per user counter, like some kind of uh, whitelist, blacklist, uh, they can have uh, like uh, uh, cost signature required for a transaction. So they can have a server that also approves the transaction. Uh, there it's provided with some extra data. Uh, so any on-chain mechanism that you can come up with uh, or off-chain as well uh, to, uh, to prevent the like civil DOS attacks uh, on a smart contract uh, basically works here. Uh, yeah, I want. To, I just wanted to add that uh, it's. A, I mean, people often think about uh, paymaster only as something sponsoring the gas, but it's not always the case. It may be a bit misleading. For example, there is token paymaster. The, the token paymaster doesn't really sponsor anything. It's the user paying. It's just that the user is paying with a, paying with an ERC20 token. So the paymaster actually pre-charges the user the maximum amount uh, the maximum amount that the transaction would cost in let's say USDC, and then uh, and, and then uh, the contract pays for the ETH. But it's actually the user paying just with a different currency. Yeah. Right. No more questions? Uh, okay, so that's it. Thank you very much.